Thanks, Miranda. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jesse Scheib. I am a licensed veterinary technician, and I also have my veterinary technician specialty in behavior, which for those of you that aren't super familiar with the medical side of things, um, it's basically just like human doctors can be boarded in specialties, veterinarians and veterinary nurses can be as well. So I essentially have your psychiatric equivalent, I suppose. I'm also a um, certified trainer through the Karen Pryor Academy. So I've got both the medical background and the learning and behavior modification. Um, and so what I, I basically work at a, um, a veterinary behavior center. So all we do is see really stressed dogs and cats. Um, and one of the probably one of the most heartbreaking types of cases that we see is going to be these dogs that are so under socialized. They have such a difficult time, you know, integrating into our big, scary human world. Um, and for me, I work up in Fairfax, Virginia, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. So we have a lot of big city life and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people bringing dogs up from the south and from overseas and that sort of thing. So unfortunately, these guys are fairly common in my practice. <clears throat> But so today we're going to go ahead and take a look at, well, OK, what can we do when we get these dogs kind of landed in our laps? How can we make their lives better? So first, you know, what exactly goes into the development of an adult dog? And, you know, most of us have heard of socialization in the past because it's such a hot topic right now, especially with everybody having been under quarantine during COVID. And so we've got sort of this influx of one to two year old dogs at this point who didn't have that normal socialization period that everybody really harps on. Um, but there's more to your adult dog than just their socialization period. So there's your, you know, basic genetic background. So, you know, just like from humans and other species, we know that if the parents are going to be a little shy, the young are going to be shy too. So genetic predisposition definitely plays into this. And one study said, this is a really wide range, which always makes you laugh, but somewhere between 30 and 60% of adult dog behavior can come from genetics versus socialization, learning history, that sort of thing. So we know that genetics is really important, but it's certainly not the end all be all. But there are other things like what we call ontogenics, which is basically what happens surrounding conception and um, and pregnancy. So things like the stress levels of the dam, for example, while she's pregnant can significantly influence the way her puppies grow up to behave. And even things like nutritional deficits. The brain is a really high demand organ in the body. And so if mom's not getting enough nutrition while she's pregnant or lactating, the puppies aren't going to be getting enough nutrition either. Um, but other things like maternal behavior, how good is mom at being a mom? Not all of us are great at it naturally, you know, um, and we see that a lot with dogs too. And then we've got things like learning history and did we have a traumatic experience and, you know, what exactly does my environment look like on a regular basis? So yes, socialization is important, but there's all these other factors that go into it. <clears throat> so what is socialization? So socialization is basically this window of opportunity that animals go through when they're young, where their innate fear of novelty is replaced by curiosity. Um, and part of what determines the length of that socialization period, especially in dogs, is their level of what we call neotenization. So basically dogs are, you know, thousands of years removed from their gray wolf ancestor that learned how to interact with humans on a regular basis. And during that process, they lost a lot of their adult behavior patterns. So for example, you know, adult dogs continue to play and bark and, you know, do our happy-go-lucky doggy things, whereas an adult wolf doesn't do those anymore. So our dogs are neotenized wolves. They're very puppy-like. And certain breeds tend to be more puppy-like than others. So for example, terriers tend to be less neotenized, they're less puppy-like, and our spaniels tend to be more so. So the more neotenized your, your breed that you're working with, the longer that socialization period is, which is why if you're looking at the literature, sometimes they'll say like up to 12 weeks, and sometimes it's up to 16 weeks, because really Really, it just depends. Um, but during that socialization period, there, our puppies are trying to figure out what is normal in their world and what is not. So anything that they're not exposed to during that critical learning period, somewhere between three and 16 weeks of age, can be met with a lot of fear, anxiety, phobia, and potentially aggression when they're older, because it's just very overwhelming for them. 
So then even after the socialization period is over, you know, like I said, there's still a lot of learning and development that goes on. Dogs don't actually finish developing cognitively or socially until they're two or three years of age. So there's still a lot that goes into that quote unquote adult behavior. And one of the things that we look at is that learning history. Um, I like to use an analogy for basically a bank account. So let's say your, your little puppy comes out and a lot of us think of it as a blank slate, but it's really not because we still have that genetic and ontogenic um, composition there. So some puppies come out of the womb and they have totally blank slate. There's no extra money in their bank account. We're not in debt yet bank account is zero. So as that puppy goes through life, we can either put money in the bank account, which would be positive experiences, good learning exercise, that sort of thing. So I'm putting money in their bank account, or when scary things happen, I'm taking money out. So ideally, through the process of socialization and learning and growing and developing and training, we're putting lots and lots of money in their bank account so they have a really great savings. So then, whoops-a-daisy, something scary does happen. It's not the end of the world. We take out maybe $10, $15. They move on with life. They're still in the green. No big deal. However, if I have a dog who comes out already sort of predisposed to being nervous or they don't have a great socialization, that sort of stuff. Every time something scary happens, we're taking more and more and more money out of that bank account. And so by the time, I don't know, maybe they land in a new home at one to one year old to a year and a half or so, they're already so, so, so deep in debt that it's really hard to pull them out of that successfully. And the other important thing to remember is that we as humans, we are socialized to a lot of things when we're younger. You know, again, especially me up here in the DC suburbs, there's the metro and there's trains and there's traffic and there's all these people all the time. But if I grew up in rural Kentucky and I never experienced any of those things, going to the big city is going to be really overwhelming for me. And the same can be said for our dogs and cats. Um, but at least as a human, I have the benefit of someone explaining to me like, hey, this is what's going to happen. Don't worry about it. Here's your protocol. Whereas with our dogs, they have no idea. You know, they look to us for as much support as possible, but I have no way of communicating with them that this is not that scary. You don't have to worry so much. So when we're dealing with dogs in general, regardless of whether they're completely normal, neurotypical, or if they've got any underlying anxiety or fear problems. The most important thing that we can do as pet owners is understand how to read them and quote unquote, talk to them effectively. So these are two of my absolute favorite dog body language books. Um, the one on the right was a bit of a game changer for me in my career. So it's a little heavier than the Lily Chin version, um, but she's done a really great job of, of looking at the different body postures and giving you several examples with her lovely drawings. Um, so either one of those would be fantastic resources for any pet owner or pet lover. So go ahead, write those down. Go ahead and order those if you don't have them already. Um, but for me, when I'm taking a look at body language, I kind of break them down into a few subcategories and we'll look at each of these individually. But when I'm trying to decide how an animal is feeling about something, I try and keep in mind this is either a good experience or a bad experience. Try not to think of it too much as a it's fine. We, we have a joke in my profession that if you have to say something was fine or OK, it probably wasn't. So try and think of it as this is good or bad. Not so much. <laughs> All right, so first one is what we really wanna see in most of our dogs. So we've got positive social body language. With these guys, they're gonna be actively approaching a person. They're gonna have really soft eye contact. They might do the little squinty. Um, when I think of the squinty eye, I think of those really sweet, big lug golden retrievers who are like, oh yeah, I just, I love everyone and I'm so squinty and I'm smiley, that kind of thing. So soft eyes, um, the ears could be slightly back. I might have a mid-level medium speed tail wag. And then the dog is going to be actively asking for um, attention or interaction where they're coming up and nudging you. So in the top right, we're going to quickly look at this. So at first he was a little, eh, I'm not so sure. Okay, now I'm all right. So he says, ah, yeah. So his ears are back. He said, that's nice. And then it says, you can have my bottom now. There you go. Get it. <laughs> so this is, this is a dog who's interested in interaction with that person. <clears throat> so then we can also have an animal who kind of approaches, but 
maybe not quite the way we would want them to. So we consider this conf conflicted body language where they, I want to interact with you, but you make me a little uncomfortable. So with this big lug here, she's like, okay, there's a person. Maybe I want to go say hi. Oh, no, never mind. Uh, not worth it. Bye bye. <laughs> so even though that person is doing everything right, he's turning his side to the dog. She's still like, nope, too overwhelming. I don't want to deal with you. Um, so here you can see that she's got a, a stress pant going on. Her tail is kind of low. It was a little, little sad wag at the bottom there. Um, but these guys, they tend to have, get startled easily. They might back away from something that moves too fast, that sort of thing. So this is a dog who, who wants to be social, but is a little overwhelmed by the idea. All right, so I know I said try not to be neutral, but the best way I could think to describe this body language is what I consider neutral avoidant, because they're not actively moving away from the thing that makes them uncomfortable. They're just kind of sitting there and hoping it goes away on its own. But these guys, they're going to avoid eye contact. They're not going to look at the thing. It's sort of like, a, if I look over here in this corner, la la la, this thing will go away. So here is my dog and my son. I do not recommend children going up to dogs and hugging them, but I know my dog and my child can follow instructions. And I said, this is a great, oops, not that video, sorry. This is a great video opportunity. Because you can see she's staring at me like, ew, ew, it's coming near me. Ugh. So she's not looking at him at all. <laughs> she did not sign up for children. Yeah. So if she were interested in that interaction, she would be turning towards him and like leaning into him, maybe giving him a little lick or a nudge on his hand, that sort of thing. But she is very intently watching me from across the room and hoping that the silly little child will walk away from her. So that's what we consider neutral avoidant. Um, and then we also have our fearful avoidant. So this dog still doesn't want to interact, but is staying away from the target and not interested in approaching very much at all. So for me, I'm kind of over here on this side and then here's the owner and one of the little girls from his family. So the only reason he's coming towards me at all is because mom is there. So I'm just tossing treats for him kind of looking at me. Mommy, is it okay? Are we okay? Yep, we're all right. Yay, junk food. Aw, I love his little check-ins with his mom. So I'm not pressuring anything. I'm just kind of letting him decide if he wants to look at me or approach or anything like that. And he says, nope, I'm going to stay over here. Thanks. So with these guys, if we've got a fearful avoidant dog, they'll, they'll stay away. They might still look. Sometimes they'll do a really hard stare, depending on the dog. Otherwise, they might do a quick shift over, look at you for a second, and then look away kind of thing. Um, but really, the, the big concept here is that they're not actively approaching. And so because he's not comfortable enough to approach me. I'm certainly not, a, not going to encroach on his personal space either. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. All right, so then this last one is what we call frenetic avoidant. So he's actively encouraging the person to walk away. Um, so this is Dr. Pike, one of the veterinarians that I work with, and we were actually doing a safer on this dog. And with safers, you do kind of have to push their buttons a little bit where normally we would not be doing this. <laughs> Normally we would say clearly not interested in me. So this is called a click kiss to dismiss. He's like, nope, don't want to touch you. Don't that sorry, don't want to talk to you. Um, so there's a lot of very obvious ignoring. Like I'm just gonna sniff over here and mind my own business. He he can't really walk away because unfortunately he's tethered. But again, she's like, hey, do you want to talk to me? Nope. <laughs> okay. So ideally, we're, we're going to interact with a dog. We kind of observe them from afar. I encourage them, hey, do you want to come over and say hi to me? Yes or no. But let's pretend this dog does approach, and we want to make sure that they're truly interested in physical affection. Because a lot of times I have dogs who approach, but it's not necessarily an invitation for physical contact. It's just I want to come over and sniff you and figure out who you are a little bit, and then I want to be able to retreat. So if we do have a dog who's in close proximity and we want to verify whether they're interested in interacting with me or not, we can do what's called a consent to pet test. Excuse me. So a consent to pet test is basically I reach down, I scratch their chest for one to two seconds and then stop and see what happens. Ideally, we're not reaching over a dog. We're not 
crouching over them or leaning, I want to do kind of a to the side, scratch the chest, and then move on. So a yes is going to be a very obvious, like, hey, why'd you stop? I'm going to nudge your hand and ask you for more. So let's take a look at a couple of yeses. So with her, she looks away at first. We're like, okay, stop. Nope, you can still cuddle me. Switch. <laughs> Come back for more. No, he's fine. All right, here's another one. So a little bit of lip licking. They're like, nope, you can keep cuddling me. <laughs> Call the dog to you. Pet for one two seconds and stop. See what they say. Yes remains near Nudge's hand. Turns hind end, leans. No, no response. Lip licking, yawning, shake off, moves head away, avoids eye contact, walks away. Mouthing, growling, snapping. Oh my gosh, look at the puppy. I know. Yeah. Here. And so traditionally for this guy, if I have a dog who rolls over on their back like that, it's typically, a, a, you know, asking them for space. But with him, again, he's very obviously nudging the hand and he says, no, we can keep doing this. And there's a cat in here, even though we're talking about dogs, don't mind that. <laughs> Sit, oh yeah. Wait, more. And another big lug of a houndy. All right. So all very obvious yeses. So then a no is going to be sort of that neutral avoidant. I don't, I'm not going to do anything. And I'm going to hope that you take this as a hint to leave me alone. Um, we might also see dogs who do lip licking. They might stress yawn. They do that full body wet dog shake off after you stop touching them. Um, they'll move away, walking away. And then of course, if we see any amount of like aggressive posturing, like mouthing, growling, snapping, that's obviously like a please stop, leave me alone. So here we have a couple. So this poor guy, he's just terrified and hiding under there. And this is a dog who's very well socialized and interested in people most of the time, but she's like, meh, no thanks. Here's the same kitty cat who's in vicious hunter mode and says, stop touching me. So this pup, um, you can't hear it because it's muted, but she's actually growling at me during this video. But you can see mom is cuddling her and, and the dog isn't necessarily receptive. She just wants to be well away from me. <laughs> and then here we are again with our safer dog, who again is no, thank you. And now we're pushing more buttons. I do not recommend doing this. So you see he slows down and he starts to stiffen. He does actually growl at her at one point. So those are all no thank yous. Okay, so now that we've kind of done this overview of, you know, what is socialization? What other things go into adult behavior? Um, how do we communicate effectively with our dogs in a, you know, very quick whirlwind tour? Now we're gonna take a look at, all right, now we do have a dog who's under socialized and fearful. Um, Generally, what we'll do is kind of put them into five sort of subcategories. So there, there are two primary diagnoses that we give dogs that are under socialized and excessively fearful. And the first one is generalized anxiety, which is just, you know, the world is kind of scary. I, I struggle with things. I'm a little nervous, shy, takes a while to warm up, that sort of stuff. But then you can have dogs who have legitimate global phobia, who are terrified all the time. And these are dogs that don't want to talk to anybody. I can't eat while you're in the house with me. I hide in the closet the whole time. I can't go outside to go to the bathroom. Those types of dogs are sort of our tier five. And a lot of what we're talking about is going to apply mostly to our tier fives, because if that is kind of our worst case scenario, all of these, you know, um, all of these strategies that we're going to use for our tier five are going to work for these one through four as well. We just don't need them quite to such an extent. So as we're going through this, like I said, we're going to assume that the animal we're talking about is a tier five. <clears throat> so these guys, um, they, they, sorry, backing up. Um, so when we're dealing with our animals, our pets, and our children for that matter. Um, one of the things that we take a look at is what we call this hierarchy of needs. And this was de developed by uh, Linda Michaels, who is, um, she's a animal behaviorist. 
And basically what she has done is broken down. These are sort of the subcategories of what make up a good life for a dog. And so on the very bottom of this pyramid, we have basic biological necessities. So I need to be able to eat. I need fresh water. I need sleep. I need exercise. I need safety, that sort of thing. And then once those things are met, now we can move on to emotional needs and social needs and training and that sort of thing. But you know, phase one with our tier fives, we have to make sure they feel safe in the first place, because if they're hiding in the closet the whole time, don't want anything to do with us, they do not feel safe. So it's our job as their guardians to find ways to make the home as safe as possible for them. And we start off by making sure that they have a cozy place that they can go to get away from our scary world. Because again, remember, if these guys are under socialized in our very human brains, I'm like, well, why would that be scary? You see me literally every single day and I have never done anything to you. So I, uh, I like to use the analogy of a giant spider living in my house. It doesn't matter how friendly that spider is if the spider is handing me a cupcake every day i hate that giant spider i don't want anything to do with that giant spider i'm going to hide in the closet because i don't i want it to go away and leave me alone so think of us <laughs> as being giant spiders to a dog that's a tier five global phobic guy um, so it doesn't matter what our intentions are we need to work with the dog in front of us. And if the dog is assuming that we're a giant spider who's gonna be totally unpredictable and come over and invade their personal space at any moment, we have to figure out ways to make ourselves as predictable and the house as safe as possible. Um, so first thing we can do is identify where does the dog tend to gravitate to when they're feeling overwhelmed in the first place. And they tend to be cozy little dark places. Um, closets are really popular. If you've got kind of a high bed and a smallish dog, they might hide under the bed. If there's a crate available, a lot of them will hide in there. Um, bathrooms are another popular one. So really just identify where do they already want to be. And then we try and make that chosen hiding place better. Um, so some things that we can do is one, make sure that they've got all their necessary biological things over there. So do they have a bowl of water? Um, can we feed them their food while they're over there? Do they have a comfortable bed? They're not going to be lying down on hard concrete in the garage the whole time, that kind of stuff. Um, some dogs like it better if you can give them a little bit of a covering. So for example, this guy here who's hiding in the closet, would he be more comfortable if we could figure out a way to maybe you know, block off that side a little bit so he's got more of a coverage and he can sort of sneak in and out. Now, not all dogs are going to appreciate that. Um, so for example, I have a dog who, um, I don't remember his history, but he he's terrified of actually being inside versus outside, which is usually the way it goes. Um, but this guy, he was he refused to come inside during horrible weather in the winter and this poor woman felt so bad for him um, and we were like okay what can we do to make him feel safer and warmer outside so we're like okay we can get a bunch of straw um, maybe we can get a heated little dog house something like that and he was like nope nope don't want any of that i know i'm gonna just go hide under the house where it's muddy and disgusting they're like, okay, fine. So um, again, this is where you have to work with the dog that's in front of you. And if we do try some of these things, see how they respond when we change that spot. And if they suddenly stop using the closet after we put, I don't know, a squishy bed in there or something, then we say, okay, he clearly does not appreciate that. Let's go ahead and take the bed out so that he can still have his spot. Um, other things that we can do, those of you that haven't heard of it, Adaptal is a pheromone product. So pheromones are chemical messengers that animals use to communicate with members of their own species. And so this one is derived from the maternal appeasing pheromone. So mother dogs produce it when they're nursing their puppies. It's very naturally calming, relaxing, enhances learning, that kind of thing. And I have found anecdotally that puppies that were weaned early or lost their mothers early, that sort of thing, they tend to be extra sensitive to this pheromone. Um, and so the adaptal comes in several different forms. One is a diffuser, which you can just plug into an outlet that's near their little hidey hole, covers about 700 square feet. It does also come in a spray, um, which I'll often use for dogs who are afraid of new people coming into the house because you can spritz them down, you know, give it, give them their doggy perfume. And then as soon as they enter the space, doggies like, ooh, pheromone, yay, this is great. 
Um, and then the last one is an is a collar version. Kind of looks like an old-fashioned plastic flea collar. Probably not an option for your really intense global phobic dogs, but just know that it's around and an option if you've got any mild stressy critters around your house. But I do really, really like Adaptal and it's over the counter lasts about 30 days. Um, and it might be one of those things where it's it's not making a huge obvious dent in the beginning, but the the effect can be compounding over time. So if it runs out after a couple of months and it stops and you're like, wow, all of a sudden my dog is way more stressed again, then you can say, okay, clearly we liked the adaptal. Let's go ahead and get another one and plug it back in. Um, so then the last one is I, you know, ideally we don't want to be approaching them when they're in their safe space. Because again, we're giant spiders. If I was in my hidey hole getting away from the giant spider, the last thing I want is for that giant spider to come over here and like fluff my bed and, you know, put my, you know, give me a biscuit or whatever. Like, nope, leave me alone. Go away. Shoot. <laughs> um, nutrition is another big part of this. So, you know, there's the old adage that you are what you eat. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're always feeding a balanced researched diet, you know, so Ideally, 75% of our dog's intake should come from a balanced dog-specific food. Um, one of the things that we see a lot with our anxiety patients is that um, like these raw gluten-free diets are really popular right now, but they tend to be really, really high in protein, which, you know, in our brains, we're like, wait, no, high protein is really good for you. Unfortunately, that's not quite always how it works. So... Each amino acid that you consume through your meals are going to be absorbed by the body preferentially. Um, and so one of our amino acids, L-tryptophan, which is the precursor for serotonin, is actually at the bottom of the totem pole. So theoretically, if I'm feeding my dog, let's say a 50% protein food, and you know, it, I'm in excess, I'm eating way more protein than I need, then theoretically my body is gonna suck up all those other essential amino acids and then L-tryptophan is gonna go, bye-bye, I don't need you, you can get flushed out. So we don't have enough precursor to make serotonin and therefore I can't have normal brain function. So anytime I have a dog with anxiety or aggression, that sort of thing, and they're on one of those high protein diets, like, no, 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 we need to switch him to a more moderate protein and it needs to be less than 27%. All right. Um, as a general rule, I don't have a huge problem with those raw homemade diets. I just want to make sure that it's balanced and your dog is getting the nutrition that they really need. Okay, so one of the things to keep in mind is that all living creatures have to be food motivated to some degree. You know, I get a lot of patients come into my clinic and they're overweight and they're not quote unquote food motivated. I'm like, no, no, no. So you have to, you have to eat to live. So we, as their guardians, we can figure out ways to use their food in a positive way to enhance their lifestyle. Um, and so for my dogs who, again, are tier fives, where they're literally not coming out of the closet right now, I can still do things like maybe get a couple of these little kibble toys. Can they do that? If not, we make it easier and maybe we just sprinkle it around rather than sticking it in a food dish. So now you have to move like two whole feet out of the closet to get your meals. I'm gonna be all the way on the other side of the house. You don't have to worry about the giant spider but it is good for you to move a little bit more than nothing. So, um, you know, as hopefully they get more comfortable in your home, we can progress to things like snuffle mats and find it games. And um, sometimes we'll make adventure boxes out of cardboard and, you know, put kibble or treats in like little pieces of paper and you can wrap them up and box it up and they can figure out how to open that. Because honestly, dogs that have behavior problems tend to be very intelligent. And so we wanna give them a good outlet for that critical thinking, excuse me, as much as we can. Um, again, within reason, recognizing who the dog is in front of us and we, we meet them where they are. Elimination stations. Okay, so like I said, most of our global phobic dogs are terrified of going outside, not coming inside. So if we have that sort of critter, um, ideally we try and find ways for them to have elimination areas in the home that are appropriate. Now, as, as a general rule, I'm not a huge fan of having my dog go to the bathroom in the house, but I'm sort of fighting this battle with my like 14 year old Corgi right now too, cause she's on prednisone and has to pee every two seconds. So, you know, sometimes it's one of those scenarios where you pick your battles, you know, is it really 
that important for me to drag my poor, terrified, frantic, screaming dog down the block to go to the bathroom? No, I really don't think it is. So if we can give them something inside where they can eliminate appropriately, as they get more comfortable, we can then start transitioning them to outside. Um, and so that's kind of where our substrate comes into play, because a lot of the times if we've got dogs that won't go outside, we're looking at things like puppy pads, which are a lot harder to transition off of than, you know, like the grass patches. So when it comes to house training dogs, there's really two factors that go into it. The first one is what we call your substrate preference, which is the thing that you're going to the bathroom on, grass, gravel, mulch, whatever the case may be, um, and then location preference. So location being this particular part of my walk, outside versus inside, that sort of stuff. So if your dog is terrified of going outside, they already have a location preference. I can't control that. However, I can control what the substrate is that you're eliminating on. And like I said, it's a lot easier to transition from grassy substrate that's indoors to grassy substrate that's outdoors. So as much as possible, I wanna try and give them a potty area that has what I want them to be peeing on long-term. Um, right, so then we still do house, quote unquote, house training <laughs> with it like we would anything else. You know, we have confinement and supervision. We go to the potty area on a schedule. Again, this is assuming you can interact with your dog at all. Otherwise, you just kind of leave them <laughs> their bathroom space near their little their little safety cubby. Um, but if they will interact with you, then we can ask them to go over here and encourage them to pee on their little potty area and make a big deal out of it when they do so. You know, have like chicken rain from the sky or hot dogs or cheddar cheese or something that's really, really tasty. That's the only time you get that awesome treat is when you go to the bathroom where you're supposed to. Those of us with kids kind of like the M&Ms and potty training. All right, so we've kind of covered the biological functions. We're eating, we're drinking, we have some safety. We're able to go to the bathroom without having a panic attack. Now, ideally, we wanna start working on some learning with them. Um, so again, when I've got an under socialized dog, a lot of what's happening is they don't understand what's going on. It's not safe, I need to avoid it, that sort of thing. So it's through training and learning that they can say, okay, if mom is with me, she's got this, I'm safe. I've got some of these alternate behaviors that I can do when I'm stressed out, so on and so forth. Um, so when it comes to working with special needs dogs, we talk a lot about the difference between training versus behavior modification or BMOD. So training is more about, can you physically do the thing that I tell you to do when I tell you to do it? So it's basically complying with a command. So come over here, sit your bottom down, lie down, shake your paw, that sort of stuff. But what behavior modification does is it comes in and says, okay, how do you feel when you're doing these things? Because at the end of the day, I don't really care if you can sit I care if you can be comfortable walking outside the front door. Um, you know, so we're really focusing on trained behaviors that we can use to teach confidence and coping strategies, because a lot of these tier fours and fives have none when they first start working with us. And when it comes to using behavior modification, there's two primary subcategories of learning that we're looking at. The first one is classical conditioning, your Pavlov's dog. I'm basically teaching the dog to associate something really, really awesome with this other thing. So for example, if I'm trying to encourage my dog, I don't know, let's say he's terrified of the metal water dish. So every time we bring the metal water dish out and we make a little tang on it, Again, I'm dropping chicken and hot dog from the sky. So if every time the dog comes in contact with this metal bowl, amazing things happen, then I'm gonna say, ooh, the bowl means amazing things happen. And so they're automatically gonna have that visceral, like joyful response when they see their metal bowl and now they're not scared of it anymore. So with classical conditioning, we're basically training their emotions and we have this concept of conditioned emotional responses. So we can have a positive CER, means I like this thing, or I can have a negative CER, which means I'm scared of this thing. So with our global phobic tier fives, they have a negative CER to pretty much everything except their closet. <laughs> so we're trying to use classical conditioning to teach them that me being present is not bad. Um, us going outside or walking around the house, whatever, these things are not the end of the world. They mean good things happen. 
And then on the other side of that, we have operant conditioning, um, which is, you know, learning through consequences. If I do X, Y, and Z, does something good or does something bad happen? And then if something good happens, then I say, all right, I'm more likely to try doing that thing again in the future. Um, so it's a bit more of an active learning process compared to your classical conditioning. So operant is basically how we teach cues to our dogs. You know, I, I use learning to get your little bottom into a sit position. I say, good job. You get a treat for that. So I'm positively reinforcing your bottom being on the ground. Okay. So practical techniques. Um, there's kind of four primary ways that we can teach skills to our animals. The first one is luring, which is how most of us teach our basic obedience type stuff. So I use a treat in my hand to move the dog into a certain position. They do the thing. They get a treat for that. Same thing with a stand. Good job. All right. So from there, we also we also have what we call targeting. So targeting is it's a little like luring, but I'm basically teaching them to choose to touch an object and then they get the reinforcement. So targeting is how we teach a lot of those hand touches, like come over here and touch my hand instead of scare, staring at that scary thing across the street or how we do. Um, a paw shake, or how we do some more complicated behaviors like closing a door. Targeting is how we start all those things. Capturing then is I'm basically sitting back and waiting for the dog to make a decision in the first place. So when I'm comparing capturing and shaping, I like to use down as an example. So let's pretend I'm, I'm at my office, I'm at a vet clinic, and I have a dog who comes in who's really upset. So he's frantically panting, pacing, moving around the room. He can't sit still. So, um, you know, it might be really hard to get him to focus for very long on trying to do that down behavior and work with him. So one of the things that I can do is maybe wait for him to offer a behavior that gets us closer to that down. So I think I have capturing, sorry, on this slide here. So this is an example of capturing. This is my parent's dog who was 12 and had no training at all. So here we are. I'm waiting for him to lie down. I go, good job. Click and treat. And I have him tethered so that he doesn't wander off into the bathroom or the bedroom. Plus I was videotaping. <laughs> so then I put treats in front of me to try and get him to stand up and he does it again. Good job. We reset and we lie down. So this is capturing. I'm not asking him to do anything. I'm just waiting for him to try lying down and I go, yep, good job. And towards the end, you can see he's like, look, I'm lying down. And now we add a cue to it. So as he starts to lie down, we add the word. So in the beginning, when I'm trying to capture that down, I'm not actually saying anything. I'm just, I'm reading my book. I'm minding my own business. I wait for him to do it. And here we are testing it. So he wasn't about to lie down and I asked him to, right? So that's capturing. So then if I have shaping into the down, I might say, okay, so I've got my frantic dog again. If he stops moving, that's closer to a down than pacing around the room. So I'm gonna reward him for just standing still for a second. Um, from there, if I can get his attention, he might offer me a sit because a lot of us teach our dogs to sit for treats. Awesome, bottom on the ground, closer to a down than you know, standing there staring at me. So I'm just picking closer and closer behaviors that get us to that fold down behavior. And then just like with the capturing, once it's fully developed and they're like, okay, here I go, I'm lying down, then I'm ready to add my cue to it so I can ask for it when I want it. So here's another example of shaping. This is muzzle training. So I'm just here, look at it, good job. Touch it, good job. Maybe put your nose in it a little bit. Oh, that was lazy, there you go. <laughs> So a few times she tries really wussy attempts and I say, no, 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 that's not good enough. You need to try harder. So all of those really big complicated behaviors that are super fancy and service doggy and all that good stuff, we teach that through shaping. So one of my favorite tricks is, can I send my dog to go grab a beer out of the fridge? Step one is, can you walk towards the kitchen? You start there. All right. So those are kind of our basic four ways of training skills to animals. So we've got our luring, targeting, capturing, and shaping. So then 
we bring in the behavior modification piece. So I'm trying, again, I'm trying to change the emotional component here. And so with desensitization, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking this really, really scary thing. So the giant spider again, and I'm trying to present it to my animal in a small enough dose that they're not panicking. So ideally they don't want to respond at all. So if that means, uh, you know, I'm trying to work, dog reactivity is a great example. So if I'm trying to work with dog reactivity, then I say, okay, dog is way over there, far enough away that my dog is going to go, meh, a dog. And then I can give them a cookie for that. <laughs> so if my dog is staring or backing away or woofing or that sort of thing, we're no longer desensitization, we're making it worse. So there's that bank account analogy again. The dog is scared, they're responding poorly, I'm taking money out of the bank account. So with desensitization, ideally I'm exposing them to the trigger so that the animal is not responding negatively to it. And then we bring in the counter conditioning component where I'm saying chicken rains from the sky. So I'm trying to teach them that no, 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 scary dog way over there is not that big of a deal because you get bacon and candy and unicorns fly out of the ground, you know, so great things happen when you're exposed to this thing in small enough pieces. So then when we use desensitization and counter conditioning together, we call that DSAC. Okay, so when we've got our tier five global phobic animals, one of the most important things is to avoid luring because I can have a very food motivated dog where that interest in a treat outweighs their fear for that moment, but then the food is gone and they go, oh boy, I am way too close to this giant spider. Ah, run away. You know, so <clears throat> I, I will do a lot of things for a million dollars. That doesn't mean I'm going to like it. So <laughs> if I'm working with my global phobic animals, I want them to be happy about it. I want them to make that choice. I don't want them to feel like I'm pushing them or bribing them or tricking them into this. So we're going to avoid luring as much as we can. And we're going to focus a lot more on that capturing and shaping. So if I'm trying to teach my really scared dog that it's okay to come towards me, what I'm going to start out by doing is maybe being on the opposite side of the house. And if I happen to see their little nose peek out of their closet, I'm going to throw that treat all the way down the hall and say, good job. <laughs> um, you know, and so that way they're doing the thing first. And I'm saying, oh my gosh, Bailey, that was such a good decision. I can't believe how brave you were to try that. And as they get better at it, they're like, okay, I took one step outside of the closet and I didn't die. Maybe I can do two steps next time and I can go, yeah, good job. And I'm going to throw the treat from all the way over here. You know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but basically the idea here is I want them to make the conscious decision to try new things. Um, Cause one of, one of the most important lessons that animals can learn during their socialization period is that choices matter and choices can be made in the first place. You know, we have this concept called learned helplessness, where originally we said, well, they learned that they can't do anything, so they don't do anything. But it's actually the opposite way around. Quote, unquote, learned helplessness, that freezing response is, is the innate behavior and making choices is the learned behavior. So for these guys that haven't been well socialized, they don't know that they can do that. And that's what we're trying to teach them. I'm trying to teach you that you can try things and good things can happen. It doesn't always have to be so scary. Okay. Other things to keep in mind when we're working with these dogs is that fear blocks learning. So if, you know, the higher their emotional intensity, the more they're fearful, the less likely it is they're going to be able to critically think about this situation, which is why when a dog is having a complete meltdown, a panic attack or whatever, all that hard work, all that training that you have done goes out the window because the critical thinking part of the dog brain is no longer working. It's the lizard brain that's going, you're going to die if you don't get out of here. And so they panic and run away. Um, and so again, everything we're trying to do is keep them calm and happy and relaxed and interested and in trying new things. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind is that anxiety and global phobia is a medical condition. Now, we didn't go over this at the very beginning, but part of the socialization period, um, what's happening is the brain is putting out all these new connections, all these little 
um, banks of information, all the possible things that this dog could ever need to know how to do. And during the socialization period, the brain gets these little taps on those connections and says, okay, that's important. We need to keep that around. That's important too. Don't forget about how to do this X, Y, and Z. So if I have a dog who's really under socialized and none of those little networks were touched, after the socialization period, we go through what's called neural pruning, where the brain says, I don't need any of this. Nothing happened, but I didn't use any of this information during that, you know, three to four month of age. So I'm just going to get rid of it. So dogs that are not properly socialized, their brains are literally not normally developed. Their brains do not function normally. So we often have this conception that behavior problems are just training problems. You know, you just need to teach them better and send them to school and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, 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 their brain doesn't work right. <laughs> it's not functioning normally. So just like any other medical condition, if I have liver disease from puppyhood, I'm going to get that puppy on liver medication and supplements right away because I know that liver cannot function normally and it needs as much medical support as possible. And the same applies for anxiety. If I have an eight week old puppy who walks into my practice and is terrified of everything, that puppy needs medical intervention. They need help. No amount of training and management is going to magically fix all of this. So Obviously, I'm a little passionate about that. Um, but any of the medications that you've heard of used in human medicine, we can use in dogs and cats these days. Um, so we use a lot of Prozac and Xanax and you know these types of things to help reduce that panic effect that, that life has on them when they're so under socialized. Um, and, and honestly, because the brain is so abnormally formed, those types of dogs need a lot more medication than just your standard I have separation anxiety or I'm reactive towards children because at least dogs with separation anxiety and reactivity, they had a normal upbringing for the most part. These dogs with socialization did not. And so we have a lot more work to do to make that brain function normally so that they can live normal lives. And unfortunately, just like other medical conditions, sometimes we can't fix this. Sometimes the brain is too far gone. And it's not fair to make our dogs live in a closet for 10 or 15 years. So we can do a lot of work and we can change our lifestyle and we can change the way we interact with our dog, get them on medication, do everything right, and it still doesn't work. So sometimes we are faced with a difficult decision of, is this fair? Is this dog happy? Is it worth it? Um, and sometimes we make the decision that no, it's not fair. And so behavioral euthanasia for a really intensely fearful animal is 100% a treatment option. Don't ever let anyone tell you that it's not because these dogs are not happy. And it's our job as the critical thinking, cognitively developed humans to make choices for them when they can't. So at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that we can do to help our dogs that were under socialized. And a lot of them can grow into really happy, healthy dogs. They might have certain fears, you know, maybe they really never get over having kids around. That's fine, you know. Um, even the dogs that are scared of kids, they typically grow up to be fine with kids in their own family. It's just don't have friends over with children. Um, you know, there, it is a really rare case that we can't make a significant dent in their stress, but it does happen, you know, but know that there's a lot of things that we can do environmentally. Um, we can do a lot with learning and we can do a lot with medicine these days. You know, veterinary medicine has come a really long way in the last 15, 20 years. So there's always hope. And on that note, I open up the forum to questions. Awesome. So much information. Um, and we have a ton of questions waiting for you. So one of the first questions back about body language was, do you have any tips around appeasement behavior? My dog seems friendly to outsiders, but I've learned she has very subtle, I'm uncomfortable cues. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's still hard to tell. Sure. So in that sort of scenario, if it's not super clear, your dog is interested in interacting. That's one of those moments where I'm like, okay, person, Keep your distance. If you want to interact with her, you can always toss her traits. I have no problem with that because food is the universal awesomeness in life. Um, but even as humans, a lot of us don't make friends by hugging or touching each other, you know? So if your dog is not inherently one of those that warms up really quickly, hands off. Awesome. Okay. Somebody else said, 
what do I do when my dog's safe space is my lap? And that's not always peaceful. <laughs> you get a babushka thing and you just carry them around. Every, you know. uh, um, I think it's actually a large dog. Oh, okay. So you go to the gym and work out more so that you can <laughs> carry them around. No. Um, really, it's one of those scenarios where you do the best you can with what you got. Um, so if they can't be in your lap all the time, obviously, one of the things that you could do is make a bed out of your stinky clothes which I know is very fun, um, but sleep in a shirt for a couple of days, put that in their bed. And, you know, if they can't be in your lap, what's their second best option? You know, um, are they crate trained? A lot of dogs that are crate trained, but nervous, enjoy going in through their crate and having sort of that cozy little spot. Um, but even working on behavior modification that focuses on, you know, this is your safe place. Um, you know, so we teach what's called a settle and relax essentially where we make their new safe space, I don't know, this specific blanket or this bed or something like that. And we, through learning, we're like, no, 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 this is safe too. This is a great place to go. So if I'm not available, here's your second option. Awesome. We had another question about a daptil and whether it's good for female dogs who may have had puppies. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a daptil is one of those products that you can use for pretty much anything. Um, out of couple thousand cases. I think I've only ever had one dog who responded poorly and she just got kind of antsy pantsy. So all products have a risk of, you know, um, side effects. You know, even if it's an over the counter, very safe product, things happen in the same way that peanuts can be safe, but not for everyone. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely use Adaptil for, for new mothers too. Awesome. What about strategies for progressing beyond just the front door? I have a dog who can make it to the end of our driveway, but trembles and tries to wriggle out of his harness if we try to go any further. We have meds on board, but it's still a struggle. Okay. Um, hmm. Step one, depending how far he's come with his medication, you could always talk to your doctor about adjusting it a little bit. So if, you know, I don't know if he started out as a tier six and now he's, what would that be like a tier four probably? Um, you know, there's still other things that we can do to help with the chemical component. But going back to that subtle and relax exercise, you can use that to improve confidence at the border. So if we're, we teach the subtle and relax in the home, part of the training is them making that mental connection that this little piece of safety can go with me wherever I go. So I like the subtle map for even things like vet visits and grooming and, you know, visiting family, they can take their little wooby blanket with it wherever they go. And you can also use it as kind of a foundation behavior for your desensitization and counter conditioning. So if, if we know at this line, he starts getting upset, maybe six feet back, put down his settlement and we're just going to hang out here and, you know, have a peanut butter Kong or something like that. And then we'll go back inside. And once he's totally comfortable with that, we move the settle spot a little bit closer and then kind of repeat from there. Awesome. Okay. We have a question about how to help dogs who are scared of slippery surfaces. He grew up on and is fine on hardwood at home, but even in friends' apartments, any stores or the vet, he's terrified of the floors. Hmm. That's a tough one because dogs don't always generalize very well. What you could do is actually teach them to wear booties instead. And then they're not slippery floors anymore. Loopholes. Yeah. I've had, I've had a couple of dogs with some very strange phobias of floors and sometimes runners are the easiest thing yeah. or deciding whether they need to be at that place. Um, I had a dog who they joked that they had to roll out the red carpet at the vet and they brought like yoga mats with them and would just roll them out for the dog because it, you know, they had to be at the vet, you know, and had to be inside. Um, yeah. But a lot of times we've used that environmental management more so. Definitely. Yeah. And honestly, that's our philosophy with most things. If I don't have to have to create a really complicated, convoluted training plan, I'm not going to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a lazy trainer. Not going to lie. Yeah. It's my, it's my favorite thing. I'm like, would I spend four hours training this thing? Nope. I would, I would set it up. So I didn't have to. Um, okay. So this one is one that I think we've all seen before help for when there's realistically no way to avoid what the dog is scared of. My dog is dog is probably a tier four, but we live in a busy city and she's too big to carry. I have to go to the vet and sit her and go potty in a small New York apartment, no room for an indoor setup. She's even too scared for nearby parks. She's been on meds for months and we're still trying to adjust, but it's hard in our environment. Get better meds. 
<laughs> again, I'm a lazy trainer and I hate saying that, but like literally if you can't manage the environment and the fear is too high to learn how to cope in that situation, you've got to get better meds on board. Um, you know, and one of the things that you can, you know, cause I don't know how um, close any of you are to veterinary behaviorists because behavior medicine is still very new and a lot of general practitioners are like, ew, I don't want to touch it. So if they have Prozac and Trazodone and that doesn't work, they're kind of like, man, I don't know what to do. Um, but my doctors at the Animal Behavior Wellness Center will do vet to vet consults or basically they can't consult with you directly because there's no legal relationship, but they can talk to each other. And my vet can say, okay, well, if you've done X, Y, and Z, try this instead and see how that goes. Um, but again, at the end of the day, you do what you can with what you got. You know, maybe just take her out twice a day. You make it real short and quick. You get back inside as soon as you can. On weekends, if she likes car rides, you can always take her to a nice park nearby. Um, I've also had some people who will do just car rides as part of their enrichment. Like you hate walking around the city, but you like smelling stuff. All right, we'll just drive around the block a couple times. You can do that too. Awesome. We got a great question. Do you see a relationship between puppies who have had to be hand raised and socialization problems? Not as much as cats. <laughs> Cats are terrible if they're bottle raised, um, but puppies, no, they just tend to be a bit more strongly bonded to humans than other dogs. So they might not learn how to play super great with other dogs. Not to say that they can't make friends. They're just kind of awkward, you know, kind of the weird kid on the playground, if you will. But a lot of them grow up to be perfectly happy dogs. Yeah, there's, um, there's only a couple of studies that I've seen that look at what happens when dogs or cats are removed from their litters really early. Some of it, again, depends on whether they were removed because maybe they were having problems, mom was really sick, like obviously all that intrauterine stuff is, is a huge impact versus like, you know, were they just somebody, somebody thought they were cute and pulled them out of the litter early. Um, but there's, there's not a ton on there. So I think this idea that like, oh gosh, they were alone. So they're going to be totally spastic. Well, they might've been raised with another litter, they're still kind of hand reared, but so there's a lot of complexity there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, on that note, I would actually much rather have a puppy that had to be pulled but raised with another litter versus a singleton puppy who got to stay with mom till eight weeks. Yep. So, yep. Not that we always get to pick. <laughs> yeah. If only we always got to pick, that would be great. No. Um, we have a tier four or five pup. He's on medication and we've med made huge project uh, progress on training on the meds. Any tips on how we can best teach our friends and family about his anxiety and how to introduce them when they come to our home? Humans are just as trainable as your dogs. I prefer M&Ms or beer, depending on the age of my learner. <laughs> um, but no, in all seriousness, if, you know, if I've got a dog who I know struggles with new people before they even come into the house, I'm like, look, we've been working oh, really hard. hard. It's like, it's right. Right. Got it. <laughs> Anyway, um, you know, we've been working really hard on helping with Bailey's introduction to people. If I asked you to do X, Y, and Z, do you think you could do it? Yes or no? And if they're like, no, okay, then either they don't come over or we put Bailey somewhere else so that they don't have to deal with, I hate to put it this way, but like incompatible communication, if you will. You know, it's kind of like if I know when I go to my friend's house, and I take my kid and their kid and mine always get into fights. I'm just not going to take him, you know, so pick your battles, essentially. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's going to sound silly, but sometimes it helps to practice with your friends with like stuffies first. That's what I do with um, like my human learners at my clinic. Like if you're if you're not sure how to do this, let's practice with a stupid dog because everybody laughs and it's so funny. And, you know, but you remember the lesson a lot better if you feel ridiculous while you're doing it. So if we practice with a little stuffed animal and this is Bailey first, you're going to be able to practice it in a real way because a lot of it is muscle memory anyway. Um, but, you know, then they're going to remember the lesson and you can bring Bailey out to interact with them. And they've already got like, okay, right. Don't touch the dog, give them cookies. Don't stand up too quickly. That sort of thing. Great. I love this question. I've thought about using situational meds for staying under threshold in a targeted training session, sort of bypassing a dog with a tiny threshold, but I worry that it's more of a mild sedative with things like trazodone. Is this something you've done? So I'll be honest, I don't really like trazodone either because <laughs> I worry about that as well. Um, a lot of general practitioners use trazodone because their situationals are more focused on like veterinary handling, but you're right. If it's a leash 
learning process. I do sometimes worry about trazodone being more of a sedative. Um, that said, it's not like other drugs, say acepromazine, where there is literally no anti-anxiety component at all. Um, you know, so back in the day, we used acepromazine for fireworks and thunderstorms and whatnot. And literally what that does, it just kind of physically paralyzes you, but your brain is still going, ah! the whole time. Whereas, whereas with trazodone, at least I know there is an anti-anxiety component to it. So theoretically they might be a little sleepy on it, but we know that they're still under threshold and they can learn. Um, really the big one to worry about is if you're using drugs like Xanax, Valium, or Clonopin, those can actually block the learning process. So you wouldn't want to do uh, focused training with those products. Awesome. Okay. Uh, someone, this is important. It's not a question, but someone said a drinking game to train your friends. Sounds amazing, which there you go. sounds great. Um, <laughs> someone said my current rat terrier foster is the queen of six foot social distancing. Once leashed by me, my husband can walk her and handle her, but he can't leash her. Any, any thoughts on cases like that, where it seems like it's a very specific thing? Yeah, so dogs are really contextual learners, meaning they can learn this very specific thing at my house, but they're not going to be able to take it over to this person's house because the environment is very different. So as far as the dog is concerned, once I'm on leash, my options are very limited. I can't get away from this person. He's got a handle on me. I guess I better suck it up and just go for a walk. However, if I'm off leash, I'm like, haha, no, you can't get me. I'm going to be over here. Leave me alone. So just because she's complying while she's on leash doesn't mean she's happy about it. I think it's, a, we, um, we talk about inhibition a lot when they're in uncomfortable situations. It's, uh, it's similar to, oh, like when you get a new job, you first go into a job and you're like, okay, I don't know these people's sense of humor. I'm not really sure how things work. So I'm going to inhibit it, inhibit a lot of my own weirdness. But as I get more comfortable and be like, hi, I told a really awkward joke. Okay, maybe that didn't go over very well. You know, but it's the same thing with dogs. You know, if they're in an uncomfortable situation, they might inhibit a lot of their outward communication because they're like, okay, well, this is life. But she's still scared when dad tries to go and hit, um, hitch her up to the leash. Awesome. I think that is all of our questions. I'll give it one more second in case anybody has questions. Again, thank you so much to Jesse Seip for being here tonight. Uh, yeah. We do have several webinars coming up in the next month. So everydogaustin.org slash webinars is where to find information about those. If you'd like to make a donation, it's everydogaustin.org slash donate. Um, thank you guys so much for being out here today. We are Austin based. If you're here, come hang out and visit us. Otherwise, feel free to shoot us an email anytime you have questions. And since I don't see anything else in the chat box, thank you so much, Jesse. I really appreciate it. This was a ton of information. So lots for folks to take away from tonight. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. Yeah. Have a great night. Bye. Thanks. You too. Bye.